to talk to, talk to you. Uh, both of us, like Philip and me, we are working for Cloud Composer, which is a managed service uh, for Airflow. Just for you to know, there is a Composer uh, corner there. So you, if you have any questions related to Cloud Composer, you can go there and ask them. Uh, in the back of the room, there are T-shirts, uh, Airflow Summit uh, 2022 T-shirts. Uh, those T-shirts are for you. So don't don't be shy and uh, and uh, please uh, take it. Uh, before we uh, jump into the very pre presentation, please fill in the uh, Airflow community survey. Um, this is this is the data that that uh, is very important for the whole Airflow community, uh, and this is uh, also a, a way for you to impact uh, and focus community on features that you are interested in. Uh, last time we ran this uh, survey, it was two two years ago. Uh, and th th this year, we just uh, wanted to uh, regather the, the feedback uh, from from you. Uh, a couple questions, a couple information about me. I'm senior engineering manager responsible for, for Cloud Composer. Uh, I have been working uh, on Airflow for almost three years. So Airflow for me is a work and hobby. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I also like to, to share my knowledge about building cloud native applications with the students. And that's why I'm delivering also lectures to students of University of Warsaw and Technical University of Warsaw. Thank you. So let me quickly introduce myself, uh, Filip Knapik. I'm a group product manager responsible for uh, Cloud Composer. I've been also working uh, with Airflow for roughly three years by now, uh, three, around three years. Uh, I will skip over my years of experience because that reveals my age. I'm, I graduated from uh, AGH University of Science and Technology in Krakow in Poland. Uh, the subject of the talk today is around lessons from the field. So before we actually dive into those lessons, let me very quickly explain what we mean by the field. So where we actually capture those learnings from. And let me do that by very quick introduction of Composer. And I promise it will be quick. Uh, so the shortest possible explanation of what Composer is, is that this is a Google Cloud product that essentially delivers a fully managed experience, fully compatible with Apache Airflow. So it's 100% compatible at the core which means that whatever you're running outside in self-managed Airflow, you can bring over, it's going to work in Composer. And even more importantly, whatever you're running in Composer, you're not locked, okay? So if you need to have some kind of an exit strategy, ability to move elsewhere at some point in time, you can totally do that. It's 100% compatible with uh, open source. So that's, uh, that's the shortest definition I can come up with what, what Composer is. It is used for typical activities that customers would use Airflow for as well. So essentially, Workflow orchestration, which we see most of the customers using it along with the data engineering or, or data processing products. And obviously, as we are in the context of Google Cloud, this would typically be, be query, data fusion, data flow, data proc, and all that. But obviously, it is Airflow. It is fully extensible. It has all those operators and sensors built for other products. So customers actually use Composer to bridge their existing hybrid environments and orchestrate the work not only in the cloud, but also on-prem, other hyperscalers, software as a service, proprietary APIs, all that. We all know the power of Airflow in terms of extensibility, and customers do it on a daily basis. Rafa will talk about it some more later on. Um, now, let me very quickly introduce uh, how Composer is designed and how it may slightly differ from self-managed Airflow implementations. So opening the hood a little bit. Um, Composer, when you create a new Composer environment, it essentially is a single Airflow instance. So single Composer environment, single managed Airflow environment. Composer uses Kubernetes engine as its compute layer. So when we create Composer environments, we use Kubernetes engine to host all of those typical Airflow components like schedulers, uh, salary workers, Airflow user interface. There is a task queue as well. And for the database, we're using Cloud SQL. So essentially, we're putting all of those things together and a few others I'm going to show in a second to make Airflow work in the context of Google Cloud as a managed service. Now, there are some things where we actually differ from what you would typically do in a self-managed Airflow if you were to create it yourself. One of the first differences is that uh, we have auto-scaling for workers. So essentially, our deployments can add or remove workers as needed based on the size of an Airflow queue. So when we see that tasks are piling up in a queue, we need more horsepower, we just add more workers. When it's not, no longer needed, tasks are done, we basically go down. So what it gives you is that you don't have to scale for the peak and obviously your cost is more optimal as well as the performance issues are not that frequent. And so 
uh, this is one of the differences we have versus self-managed uh, deployments. Now, there are some others. Like, for example, we also have slightly different or maybe additional user interface for Airflow, where on top of the typical open source Airflow user interface, we also have a cloud native user experience built into the Cloud Console and directly integrated with the rest of our user experience in Google Cloud. Um, now, there's also a bunch of other products we're built on top of, uh, just to give you a holistic and, and cohesive uh, deployment, which essentially creates a fully managed enterprise grade application. So we use, for example, cloud identity access management to manage access controls. Storage is used for ingestion of your DAGs or plugins. There's logging, there's monitoring and all that. There's a long list of other services we're built on top of. The message is when you create a composer environment, it is 100% Airflow underneath and it's built on top of and with other cloud products to make it enterprise ready. So very quick summary. So where Composer slightly differs from open source Airflow is it's quick to deploy because a couple of clicks, a quick wizard, and you have the environment up and running. It comes with a bunch of enterprise security features. So for example, if as an enterprise, you need to have your own encryption keys for data at rest, it's a feature. You can configure it. You don't have to think, how would I do it myself? Okay. So all of those things that enterprises need to comply with and secure their uh, resources with is basically implemented in Composer out of the box. It's a managed infrastructure service. So things like patching of the underlying infrastructure, virtual machines, Cloud SQL, all of that is taken care of. So you don't need to worry like, you know, is the operating system of the underlying stack up to date? It is because it is fully managed. It comes with monitoring, with logging. If you encounter any issues, there is a support team that is going to help out. Uh, by the way, big thanks to the support team that is partially also in the room. Um, so in case uh, customers encounter any issues, they can reach out and there will be somebody to help them out. And last but not least, it is all 100% compatible with open source. So your DAGs are fully portable. Okay, so we're not locking anyone in and we will not. I mean, we're, we're committed to open source and we're going to stay this way. Now, the message or, or the flow of this uh, talk is around lessons from the field. And one of the core or first learnings I would like to pass is that Airflow is awesome. And I know it's, you know, I'm somewhat preaching to the choir because all of us are working on Airflow. Many of us would agree with that. But trust me, it's not just us. I mean, we're biased, but we're also hearing this from our customers. So many of our customers, obviously not all, but many are saying Airflow is awesome. I like it. I see the direction going. I, I see the product going the right direction. And obviously this is a, a big a contribution of all of us in the room and others online that made it happen. So basically the Airflow community is at the heart of Airflow and the progress that has been made over the last months or years is absolutely visible and appreciated by customers. So that's the first thing I wanted to very quickly point out that customers really appreciate where Airflow is heading and how it's developing, how it has become mature over the last years. Uh, one more thing that I'd like to pass uh, over also as a, as a very quick hint is that customers are also um, highly appreciative of Airflow 2. Believe it or not, but not all the customers are using Airflow 2 yet. Many of them are still in Airflow 1, the reasons of which we're going to cover later on. And as they switch from Airflow 1 to Airflow 2, they get to see the difference. And they very, very frequently, they're coming to us saying Airflow 2 is so much better. It's much more efficient. It's, you know, the user interface is so much better. It's more stable. Uh, you know, you know all that. So the message is the milestone that we have gone through as a community, like two years ago or whatever it was, has been appreciated by customers and people really see the difference. And as they switch, they, they see how much better it is. So just wanted to reiterate that as well as a feedback from, from the customers. And obviously, uh, the, the one, one of the last things uh, I'd like to pass here is, um, the power of Airflow lies in the richness of its operators and its extensibility. And this is also something that customers raise almost every single day, that these are the things that made them choose Airflow or use Airflow. And all of those things together make Airflow a very attractive offering. And we see tons of customers starting to use Airflow, starting to use Composer in our case, on every single day. So uh, we see a very massive interest from the community at large from, from enterprises at large uh, that are interested in Airflow. We actually don't have to convince customers that much to go with Airflow. They're coming to us with awareness of Airflow and with interest to use Airflow. So again, I just wanted to reiterate that, that this has been a massive improvement over the last two years and general perception of Airflow among our customers 
is really, really positive. With that, um, let me pass over to Rafael for additional points. Okay. So uh, when we were uh, just just one one additional comment about our presentation because when we were brainstorming together with Philip, uh, what kind of presentation we want to deliver during this uh, summit, we're kind of on the fence whether it should be like very technical, diving into the nitty gritty details of technical features, or maybe we can propose a presentation uh, that is going to pass some information from the end users, users who actually use Airflow. And we decided actually to to, um, to to devote our time to 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 pass the messages from from the users of Airflow. Um, so we are more here as messengers, um, uh, and uh, we we do that because I think that it's important uh, for us to understand that the 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 user base of Airflow is growing. We have more and more uh, non-technical users using uh, uh, Airflow. Uh, and we have also a lot of users who don't know Airflow uh, almost at all, and they are like experiencing a learning, learning curve. And so our observations uh, stem from from the quotes or from the feedback that we get from uh, from from the users. Uh, so the first uh, observation is that uh, the power of Airflow uh, lies in, uh, in 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 the fact that it's very extensible. Uh, a lot of uh, of this extensibility lies in Airflow providers. Um, uh, so we deliver, like we have hundreds of, uh, of uh, operators uh, supporting something like uh, around 70 different different providers and the, the list of providers actually grows. There is a really active discussion right now how to uh, better uh, scale Airflow community to accept even more providers because there are more and more uh, services and service offerings who would like to be part of Airflow community. One interesting thing that, that might be actually interesting for you is that uh, of the shelf of Airflow providers, they, those providers don't cover all the needs of the users. And uh, based on the data that, that you have within uh, a Composer, uh, composer service, uh, more than 60% of the tasks uh, that users um, run uh, on Airflow hosted by Composer are implemented uh, thanks to Python operator, Bash operator, Kubernetes pod operator, GKE pod operator. So actually, this is actually a power that uh, Airflow brings. So you either use off-the-shelf uh, Airflow providers, or if you if those providers don't meet your needs, you just extend, um, uh, extend, uh, or implement your own uh, uh, operators. So, like we as a community, we need to keep doing a good job when it comes to improving providers and adding new ones, uh, and we cannot lose this extensibility through the custom custom operators uh, uh, that um, that users can implement on their own. Uh, another another observation uh, that, that we have. That this is something that I already mentioned. Uh, we have more and more users who actually uh, are not tech savvy. Maybe they are more on the business side of things, some, something like this. They are definitely not in, uh, engineers. And some of them, they are eager to learn what Airflow is about. <laughs> and some of them, they say they are not interested in getting into the details of uh, how scheduler works or executor works. They just want to take benefit of Airflow uh, as it is. Uh, all the features that, that are delivered within Airflow are Good, good enough for them, and they just want to to to, to use it. So some of the quotes that uh, that we that we get when talking to, to users of uh, Airflow within Composer, I just want to focus on running my DAG, and I'm not interested in uh, managing or tuning uh, Airflow. This is one of the of the pretty common statements that we that we get from the users. Some additional one ones you can see uh, in the middle of this slide. So. Uh, I don't want to actively manage Airflow environments. Uh, I really like the fact that Airflow is stable. The quality is there. Uh, I'm not really interested even into moving to a newer version of Airflow because uh, what I have already, for example, in Airflow 2.1 or 2.2, this is good, good enough uh, for me. Uh, in Cloud Composer, we have also even environments that were created three years ago. Believe it or not, uh, those environments uh, are using Airflow 1.9. Uh, still based on uh, Python 2. And believe it or not, those environments are fully operational and users are using it for the last three years. And uh, actually, they still don't have plans how to migrate to newer version uh, of Airflow. So it's not even Airflow 1.10, it's 1.9. Uh, but those users, 
are super interested in uh, using uh, using Airflow because there, it brings a lot of benefit uh, to them, uh, and they assume that everything works automat uh, automatically for them. Uh, there is some like built-in assumption when they start the journey with Airflow that Airflow somehow is able to tune itself. And for example, DB uh, database uh, pruning or uh, like maintenance is happening automatically uh, for them. So we, of course, to a certain extent, Airflow is able to handle different different configurations, different DAC workloads, but definitely we would uh, um, bring much more value to those users if we invested uh, into features that would tune, uh, uh, for example, scheduler or seller, uh, seller parameters, uh, definitely a, me a mechanism that would uh, automatically do the data uh, database retention, like removal of the uh, old logs of executed tasks. This is something that they would um, greatly uh, benefit, mm -hmm. benefit from. Um, what is also really here important that Airflow is uh, as a distributed uh, a distributed computing layer it runs on another distributed layer, uh, and we have a couple of options here. The, the most popular one right now is uh, Kubernetes. So we need to make sure that those integrations uh, um, between Airflow and those uh, those uh, distributed underlying layers are done in the correct uh, correct way. Another thing that people really value is that out of the box experience the one they start their journey with airflow uh, is like smooth they don't need to tune anything it basically just works uh, on the other hand we know that airflow uh, is famous for being very extensible and you can uh, like tune a lot of things in airflow for the sake of this presentation i calculated how many uh, parameters right now we are supporting in airflow so uh, there are more than 300 different parameters that can you can set in different uh, uh, way. It slightly uh, varies by Airflow version. We have also some uh, intermediate phases when we have uh, some new parameters. Some other deprecated parameters are still there to, to keep the backward compatibility. But in general, overall, we have quite a lot of uh, uh, parameters. Uh, and for users who start the journey with Airflow, this is a little bit overwhelming. So we have actually, so with this great power of flexibility it comes also be quite a big complexity. Uh, and if you are an expert in Airflow, definitely you are uh, able to benefit from, from those cap uh, configuration capabilities. Interesting thing is that uh, once we deliver Airflow within, within Cloud Composer, people start using it. If they stay with defaults and those defaults are working fine for them, everything is perfect. The moment they start uh, reconfiguring uh, Airflow, like for example, change parameter of uh, parameters of scheduler, uh, seller uh, uh, framework, workers, this is the moment when they start experiencing problems. And most of them unfortunately misconfigure Airflow until they get to the point that they are becoming like a little bit like experts in, in Airflow. So our observation is that uh, if, if we want to really make uh, life easier, for those uh, users, uh, it would be great to, to have some auto-tuning uh, capability in Airflow or some kind of a recommender that would basically analyze the workloads that users have and adjust parameters uh, uh, automatically for the for those uh, uh, users. As a, as a, as we kind of mentioned, uh, some users never they they never will be will become uh, Airflow experts because in general Airflow is, is hard and also cloud computing is hard. So if we want to keep uh, like Airflow momentum and we want to uh, grow Airflow, uh, Airflow users base, definitely uh, let's make uh, Airflow as easy as it, uh, to use as it is uh, possible. Uh, the third observation uh, that we have is that uh, the better Airflow becomes, uh, the higher expectations of the users are. And what we really mean by it, one thing that, that we already mentioned is that uh, if something works for users, uh, they will, uh, and they are happy with a given Airflow version, they will stay with this version forever until something happens. For example, they need to uh, develop a new feature and this new feature is supported in, uh, in the newer version of uh, uh, Airflow. So this is what we see. Quality is high, stability, stability of the features is high, features are there. So user, users of uh, Airflow actually ask, the, uh, ask uh, themselves the question, why I, why I at all need to uh, update to newer version of Airflow? 
and usually they they make a, they are on defense and they are making the decision to stay with a given uh, version of airflow they are using another thing that we see is that they can fully rely on airflow and they start to use uh, airflow docs as part of the critical business processes so it also a little bit complicates uh, migration to newer versions of uh, airflow because the, the whole process business process will relies on it and if something goes wrong uh, they are impacting the, the, the business. So we have, for example, users who on a daily basis run DAX uh, and some machine learning models that update prices of the products in the online shop. So for them, it is super critical that, that those, those DAX run on a specific day, uh, time in, uh, in a day. And uh, this is done like in a predictable way every, every day. Otherwise, they can lose some, some, some business because a DAX didn't, didn't run properly. So in general, what we see is that we have two groups of users, those who are very interested into getting the newer version of Airflow because there are fancy features that they want to use. On the other hand, we have really, really group, uh, huge group of users who, stay, uh, who stayed with the previous version of Airflow. So right now we have more Airflow 1 users than Airflow 2 users. Uh, for for us, it was a little bit like a, like a discovery because uh, in in the moment when Airflow two was announced that we started offering uh, it within Cloud Composer, we thought okay, it will be like a it will be super quick and people will will migrate to Airflow two. And for, uh, actually, it, we were kind of wrong because a lot of users stayed with Airflow one and they are planning to stay with Airflow one for as long as it is possible. That's the reality. But one important thing for the uh, for the community is that if we really want users to move from uh, older to newer versions of Airflow, we need to make upgrades and those transitions, migrations as smooth as possible. Because the moment the users uh, discover that they need to make some changes in, in their DAX, for example, this is the moment when they are uh, questioning whether this migration should actually uh, happen and what is going to, to give to them. Uh, another observation uh, that, that we have is that uh, users don't like deprecations. Um, uh, they, they hardly read any release notes uh, and they are not eager to, to, to make changes in, in, their, uh, in their code. Um, so whenever we are introducing any changes in operators, in Airflow configuration parameters that maybe impact the deployment procedure for Airflow, uh, like changes in the names of Airflow uh, connections. Uh, this is something that, that users don't like because it means a change for them. If, the, if you are talking about uh, tens or hundreds of production systems that are based uh, and rely on Airflow environments, this is a problematic thing uh, for, for them. They also don't like all those deprecation messages informing them, okay, this parameter is no longer supported. Please migrate to a newer one. It litters their job uh, logs and uh, and basically makes uh, mm, uh, troubleshooting of their DAX a little bit uh, harder. Yeah, and Alpha one versus Alpha two. Yeah, we introduced a couple of changes between Alpha one and, and Alpha two in favor of Alpha two. Uh, but as a result of it, we have pretty big user base uh, that sticked with Alpha one and they are not planning to move to Alpha uh, two. Um, Another thing that, that we learned uh, from users is that they don't like retries in their DAX and uh, uh, tasks. Uh, and this is somehow related again to having high expectations from, from Airflow, which is like state of the art uh, workflow uh, technology. We as engineers, uh, we know that uh, uh, distributed systems may have problems like uh, transient, transient issues. We know the fallacies of uh, uh, distributed uh, computing. Some, sometimes networking might not work, uh, might be uh, bigger latencies in, in the communication. Uh, also, all the services that we are using in our DAX, uh, they are not 100% available. There is some availability associated with each uh, of the service. The, the, the funny thing is that uh, users of Airflow actually don't care. They maybe, I, I think that they, they are going through to, to two phases uh, here. First of all, they, dis they, they discovered that uh, in their DAGs uh, are necessary. Uh, and this is, this is our recommendation to, to users. Your DAG should be item potent. Uh, it needs to be uh, uh, rerunnable. Uh, and if there's any problem, for example, communication problem to the service, you are going to address it through a retry of a task. 
So this is the first. This is the first moment that they realize, aha, I need to have three tries. Uh, but the, the second phase uh, that they, that many of them uh, uh, realize is that actually retrying causes problems to them. So uh, especially in case of the tasks uh, which are time consuming and to talk to other services, uh, it is additional cost for them. So for example, rerunning a query in BigQuery or rerunning a, a data data flow job, it might cost like tens or hundred even uh, dollars in the rupees, uh, Polish zloty or euros. Uh, sometimes it also takes uh, hours to rerun a task. For example, if we are talking about the training machine learning model, uh, and if they are like putting these DAGs into to be a, on the critical path to, of the uh, business processes, some decisions are uh, delayed because because of this. So. Uh, our kind of uh, learning uh, and uh, motivation to, to improve airflow is, is let's make it uh, let's make airflow as fault tolerant and uh, as, as it is possible because users expectation is that ducks are executed in 100 uh, percent uh, and this is very predictable uh, and even with tries might be might be problem problematic uh, the, the 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 another observation is, is that uh, Usually, uh, usually, when it comes to adoption of Airflow in companies, is someone likes Airflow and they somehow convince a, a company to start using uh, Airflow in their company. Uh, and there is a person or or a team of people who take care of uh, of uh, Airflow environments. Uh, so they they basically create them, manage them, manage the life cycle of them, uh, and do the governing uh, of them. They they are giving access. Uh, to uh, to users to to this airflow environments and another group of people is uh, you, are users who actually develop DAGs. Um, uh, they uh, they deploy the DAGs and uh, they are waiting for the results of uh, of uh, the DAGs. So and this is the moment when uh, everybody when when they look at the the airflow they would like to have as much multi tenancy as it is uh, possible they would like to have user and DAC isolation so they are not uh, stepping on each other uh, uh, toes so of course in in uh, in airflow we have uh, access control in the ui so this security model allows you to separate uh, users at least in the uh, ui uh, in the ui uh, dimension uh, this security model is not supported uh, fully in some uh, on some other interfaces. For example, when it comes to deployment of DAGs into environment, or for example, if you are running uh, Airflow on uh, Kubernetes, uh, this is yet another interface that you you need to kind of manage and uh, you need to uh, assure some uh, control mechanisms. So not every user uh, is an administrator in Airflow uh, environment. We have also roles. Uh, of course, roles are connected with access control in the user interface. You can assign to, assign users to roles. In Cloud Composer, we actually implemented an additional feature built on top of this role-based access control. And if you if you have a, a storage for your DAX, you can create folders and put DAX into the specific folders. And we will assign those DAX to roles based on the location in the in the kind of file file system uh, so ju just just for us to, to know users really like those features but they want more uh, they they want uh, to be uh, to be sure that for example i cannot deploy a duck that is that is messing with the content of the database uh, we have some additional mechanisms uh, that uh, prevent from users uh, to other toes. So, for example, right now you can have two different DAC files with the same name. Uh, those two DAC files will be deployed in, into uh, Airflow, uh, but only one one DAC instance will be running, and it will be like random, whichever is uh, parsed uh, faster by by the scheduler. So, definitely, we have we have much more th things to to do uh, here. Um, th that's why. We are really uh, keen on those uh, new initiatives uh, run by Jarek and uh, Mateusz, uh, Mateusz Hans uh, from, from Google that are focused around building uh, capabilities of multi-tenancy. And maybe maybe this is not a final answer for multi-tenancy in Airflow, but this is like a basic uh, features 
that we need to start uh, building more multi-tenancy in, uh, in Airflow. Okay, so just to ensure that you don't perceive our presentation as complaining, I just wanted to again reiterate that we believe and our customers also say that loud and clear that Airflow is actually amazing. And again, we do see a lot of customers joining our platform using Composer, using Airflow and interested in the product every single day. Um, and as Rafael mentioned, uh, the success of Airflow and the fact that it's so much uh, let's say broadening its scope, broadening its reach to customers is also a challenge for us because more business critical workloads are running with Airflow, the higher the expectation. So uh, we obviously have to catch up and uh, address those requirements by making sure that the product, uh, the Airflow itself is at the proper level of quality, is meeting the, the quality performance and governance standards that customers uh, bring, bring, bring over to us. Now, one of the conclusions from all this that we'd like to pass is that as an Airflow community, we should aim to support Airflow's flexibility and hide the complexity. The flexibility, all those extensions, bash operator, Python operators, everything else that Rafa mentioned is at the core of the value that attracts customers. So customers are not limited by the you know rich, but still somewhat limited operators. They will never meet all of the requirements. They will never cover all of the systems. The fact that Airflow is so extensible it's one of the reasons, I believe, why Airflow is so popular. So we have to keep it up because that's what customers are coming to Airflow for. At the same time, it is still slightly more complex than it probably has to be in some places. Like, for example, what Rafa mentioned, all of those attributes, like 300 of those or configurations that you need to or may need to uh, interact with, for some users, this might be overwhelming, right? So ability for us to simplify that without sacrificing the flexibility would be a sweet spot, would be a win that would enable us to open up to new Airflow users and basically broaden the reach that Airflow has. So that will be kind of the, the direction we would strongly uh, you know, encourage all of us to, to follow. And just to keep the momentum of the Airflow growth and let more users uh, benefit from what Airflow provides, uh, again, to expand uh, the, the community, to expand the customer base, we'd like to you know, somewhat recommend to all of us as an Airflow community the following directions and, and again happy to discuss it further but high level uh, improved auto healing and false tolerance is at the heart of resilience that customers running critical business processes demand okay so the more we can do in this space the more uh, airflow becomes uh, let's say um, re reliable uh, in the context of for example underlying infrastructure issues not affecting backgrounds the higher the customer satisfaction Simplified airflow configuration, that's something we're seeing a lot. Again, as Rafa mentioned, most customers that we've seen, that we talk to, actually have their environments to some extent misconfigured. And if most of them do it this way, then probably there's something we can do to make it slightly better. Again, I don't want to make it sound like it's negative. It's an opportunity, right? It's not a problem. It's an opportunity we can go for to make it better. Um, feature deprecation is something especially that enterprise customers struggle with. Uh, because of the cost, because of the criticality of business impact, of switching between versions, upgrading, and all that. So we need to really think carefully before we deprecate any feature, because, before we remove any attribute, uh, or before we introduce a version that requires code changes. By the way, this is the most painful element, switching DAC code from one to B, from, from A to B, for example, that sometimes is needed between Airflow 1 and Airflow 2, is particularly painful. Think of it as I have few thousand DAGs and now I need to change them, right? So, so this is something we really need to be uh, careful about. And the last thing that also Rafa mentioned, DAG and user isolation. So this is something that would give customers extra efficiency, uh, less environments to manage, more business value at the same time, or the same business value with a lower number of environments to think of. That would be also the value that customers will be seeking for. So again, these are the feedbacks. These are the inputs we're getting from our customers. And we thought like sharing this with the community just to improve our collective awareness based on the customer base that we're dealing with, where we're talking to uh, on the Composer side. Uh, so with that, I wanted to thank you and open to any questions. We're actually a bit of ahead of time. So I don't know if there are any questions in the room or online. So first of all, first of all, uh, no, thank, thank you. So first of all, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Philippe, and thank you, uh, Rafael. Big clap uh, first. <laughs> 